Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. And it says, These are the commands, decrees, and laws that the Lord your God directed to me, directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his degrees and commands that I give you, so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God your ancestors, the God of your ancestors promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk down the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie the symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your house and on your gates. Good morning, friends. It's good to be with you. I'm going to go ahead and re-engage in prayer um, as we pause together. Let's go ahead and close your eyes if you don't mind. Take a few seconds of silence. Creator God and Jesus, the Good Shepherd, we believe that your purposes are at work in hidden and often unnoticed ways. We believe that your purposes are reliable and we trust that your ways are at work regardless of our attitudes and actions. And we believe that you work in and through all things to bring about good. As we struggle to see your plans and purposes, may we grow in our attentiveness and awareness to these truths and your presence in our lives. Father God, may my words be from you today, and may this message convey your faithfulness, and it's in the name of your Son, Jesus, and through the power of your Holy Spirit, we all say, amen. It really is good to be with you. Um, Today, we're going to be wrapping up our series on Joshua and the working title that Leslie gave me. I'm not sure where he went. Where did he go, by the way? Leslie, are you with June somewhere in here? Leslie, I just have to say this, this is not in the script at all as far as my notes go. Leslie said, what's better when things are 100 degrees? And I looked over at Michael, I was like, air conditioning, right? (laughs) Watermelon is on there, man, but I'm thinking like if I have a choice to go inside, uh, I'm going inside when it's 175 degree heat index, so we're good to go. Um, This is the working title that Leslie gave me today uh, or during the series, The Legacy of Joshua. So I want to thank Leslie for walking with us and exploring the life of Joshua over the last few weeks. And so here's where I want to shift this, though. I want us to begin to think about what it looks like to talk about the legacy of Joshua's, plural. And I hope that'll make more sense here in just a few minutes, because I want us to look at, really look at, explore what it looks like for you and I as people, for you and I as a church to cultivate a generation of Joshua's. And so you got to start with legacy, right? Just the word legacy. I think most of us probably in here have an understanding of what legacy is. It can be something that's passed down from generation to generation, right? Time period to time period. A lot of times we think about monetary items, uh, maybe inheritance, or but a legacy, something that is passed down, right? Or legacy could be something that is um, left from the character, uh, the reputation, or the life that you lead, okay? And so uh, it could be things like values and wisdom and faith and strength and resilience, but it sets an example for those who are coming up for their future and it lives through time. And so there are a lot of things that come to mind. I'm going to give you a couple of playful ones as I think about legacy. And Blake, I can't help, this, sorry, um, I think about you. And I think about one of the things that you have left and you are leaving your family is this music, Everybody, every one of your kids, can sing and play instruments. Um, There's this amazing legacy of music and worship in the life of Blake. 
Um, that's one. Uh, you're not on the screen, though. Um, I think about these friends of mine. This is uh, Mickey Sudo and Patrick Bertoletti. They are the winners of the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest of 2024. What a legacy, right? She ate 51 hot dogs, bun and hot dog included. He ate 58, breaking his personal PR, right? It's a lot of hot dogs, man. But what a legacy. Stan and I tried to do this, and we got through three. Didn't even happen. Didn't happen. Stan won't eat a hot dog. I'm just kidding. Uh, or without the bun, you will. It's good. Here we go. So this is a legacy, right? Um, again, some are playful. I'm going to shift dark. We're going to come back. But here we go. Here's another one. I don't know if you know this guy or not. I want to meet this dude. He is a local Sumner County Gallatin resident uh, named, uh, let me get his name right, David, uh, David Hoots. Check this out. He got second place in the U.S. Mullet Championship in the United States this year. <laughs> Second best mullet in the United States. That's a good-looking mullet. What a legacy, right? Oh, Albert Speer. Albert Speer was probably one of the most accomplished architects in the 20th century. Uh, highly regarded and successful, incredible family man, devout husband, wonderful father, loved and cared deeply for his family, but he wasn't just anybody's architect, he just happened to be Hitler's architect. Pretty dark. So he became the minister of armament in, and development in Nazi Germany, and in the Nuremberg trials he was declared responsible for tens of thousands of of deaths, and he actually has become a fascinating case study in theology and psychology for self-deception. We say, "How do I know that I can lie? To, I can lie to myself, and I can still know that I'm doing it." He lived by three principles. Y'all check this out. He would not talk about others. He wouldn't talk about his frustrations that he had with work, and he would not talk about politics in the social surroundings of his time. Nazi Germany. World War II, he would not talk about politics. And in 1944, when he was invited to tour Auschwitz, he looked away and insisted on his ignorance of the Holocaust. He's quoted as saying, I just wanted to be a good architect. He's got a legacy. Martin Luther King Jr., arguably the most prominent figure and leaders in our civil rights movement in America until his death in 1968, organized and participated in countless nonviolent efforts to protest racial injustice, and he sought equality and human rights for African Americans. His legacy lives on today. It's legacy. Some of you may recognize this sweet woman, Mother Teresa. We used to call my mom Mother Teresa. Um, she had a sweetness about her as well, but she dedicated her life to the poor. Serve the disabled, blind, lepers, open schools, orphanages, medical clinics, homes for the elderly and homes for the dying. She has left a huge impact and legacy on humanitarian rights in our world. It's just legacy. All right? So as we begin to think about legacy and what that means, especially if we look at back at Joshua, I want to ask you this question as we move forward, maybe. Um, what kind of legacy are you and I leaving behind I should contemplate that just for a little bit what kind of legacy are we leaving behind a matter of fact are you and I intentionally dreaming and planning to pass on something good and valuable to the generations that are coming behind us you can look around this room you can see tiny ones children there's students in here there's young adults in here I'm asking are we really intentionally dreaming and planning to leave something behind for them that is valuable and good and priceless as they move forward into the future what kind of legacy are we leaving behind so let's go back to Joshua for this I'm going to go back to the very first of my introduction I want, to, I want to review just a couple of things as we move forward and that's this Joshua knew who he was Joshua knew what he had and Joshua knew what he had to do. We talked about the fact that he knew who he was as far as his identity goes. He knew the talents that he had, the gifts that he had, and he had a mission that God had given him. But this had been going on for a lifetime. 
Joshua had been forming over a lifetime. His skill set as a shepherd and a leader had been forming for some time. And then we talked about this. What happens when Joshua doesn't know who he is? And we talked about our role a little bit. The fact that everybody in this room has a role in shaping and forming and shepherding the people that we love and the young people that are around us from time to time. What happens when Joshua doesn't know who he is? We'll get back to that in a few minutes too. And then we ended with this for the most part. God wants who you are, God wants what you have, and God wants what you do. It kind of comes out of Ephesians chapter 10 that we're a masterpiece created with intention with good works to do in Jesus. So all of these things we talked about when it came to Joshua. And then we had all of our kids, if you remember, come on stage. And you stood up with our children and you made a commitment to them. And part of that commitment was as we look to the future and as we think about the time and place that we live in, not to abandon our children, but to be with them, to walk with them and to care for them and to teach them, to help them observe. And so that's part of where we were. But um, I also asked this question. I said, what do you think about when you think about leaders, influential leaders specifically? I gave you a few seconds to think about who came to your mind. But then we asked this question. You have that picture in your mind, but then in what ways do those pictures or images compare to God's emphasis on the humble service, empathy, self-awareness, protection, sacrifice, and care that should characterize Christian leaders? So in other words, the leaders that we think are influential in our world and our life, are those values and are those leaders of the things that they believe in, are they consistent with what God's value system is when it comes to leaders. But here's the center of gravity where I want to park it today. All right, so the next thing I had put up last time was this. Joshua, neither Joshua nor Moses, in my opinion, after reading the material, was not concerned about being the sole spirit-led leader of God's people. Joshua had one concern. His goal was for God's people to be led by the spirit. You see the difference? He's most concerned that God's people be led by the Spirit, not so much putting the attention on him. So this message, it's about Joshua, but it's not about Joshua. Because you can't put that kind of weight on one person and expect for that person to do everything. Uh, Joshua was surrounded by people, but he was more concerned than anything about God's people being led by the Holy Spirit. So again, I want to ask you, what kind of legacy are you and I leaving behind? And that question of spirit-led is where we're going to park this in just a moment. One of my favorite things to do, or at least speak about when I'm at weddings with people, probably some of you are in here whose weddings I've officiated. I don't know if Mason McClendon is in here or not. Mason, are you in here anywhere? Um, Mason could answer this question out loud pretty quick through premarital counseling. Um, but one of the things we talk about when I'm at the front of the room and we're about to officiate the wedding is the fact that these two people are standing here about to make a commitment to each other and, uh, and get married. And one of the things I always say to them is, I want you to turn around and I want you to look at the people. You've heard me say this before. Look at the audience, turn around, and I want everybody to smile at you, uh, take pictures if they want to. We don't take much pictures because the wedding pictures can't get out until the bride says what pictures can get out, right? So we want to keep those pictures on the DL. But you can take a snapshot. But I want them to see the faces that are smiling back at them. And I want them to see the people who are sitting there. Because those people, by and large, if they are at your wedding, they're probably a pretty special component to your life. You have invited them to come be a part of this party as you say yes to your fiancé. And so I say to them, look into the eyes of these people. Because the decisions that you're making right now are possible because a lot of the decisions that have already been made long before you got here. Make sense? Long before you got here, there were decisions made by your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and the list goes on and on and on for you to be standing right here at this moment before you make this decision. It's pretty fascinating. And so with that kind of thought process in mind, I want you to consider where, or at least the reality, of where you and I are living right now in this season of life in 2024 based off decisions that were made long before you and I existed, which include this church, by the way. This church family, this church family has a history of decisions that were made long before we are now living in what we call the Hendersonville Church of Christ era, right? And so as you think about that, what kind of future will our current decisions cultivate for those who are coming behind us? I really do think if we were intentional about these things, it might change the way that we speak. 
It might change the way that we make plans. It's certainly going to change the way that we discern different things. If we think that the decisions that we are making right now are going to affect those who come behind us, and they are going to be living into decisions that we made, right? And so I keep thinking this, what kind of legacy are we leaving behind? So then you get to come to this question. You keep talking about being spirit-led. So what does being spirit-led actually mean? Holy Spirit-led. And what does spirit-led look like? Um, One of my favorite theologians um, says it like this. It can be defined as intentionality or intentionally opening ourselves and partnering with the Holy Spirit. It's full participation in God's life and God's good future here and now. It means that all of our attention, decisions, values, relationships, speech, practices, habits, and life rhythms are lived under the influence, guidance, and empowerment of God's Spirit. As transformed, Spirit-led people, we learn to listen and see ourselves, or life, ourselves, and others through the lens of the Holy Spirit. It is all-encompassing. When we think about what it means to be spirit-led, it would be that nothing, there is nothing that we would do that did not include the Holy Spirit's influence as we walk through life. And then we open ourselves to that reality of being led by the Spirit. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take three aspects about what it looks like to be spirit-led from when I read the book of Joshua, when you read the book of Joshua. I want to take things that they walk through and heard and lived by and attempt to place it practically in our lap and think, man, if we could do some of the same things that they did, what would it look like on the other end of our journey? Leslie's already mentioned we live in a little bit of a volatile world. Well, guess what? They did too. It was volatile then, and I think that's why some of these first things come out. So spirit-led people, if you're a note taker, spirit-led people of God cultivate a legacy of strength and courage. This is, I don't know if I've got it up here. Uh, I just copied and pasted the first 19 verses of chapter 1 of Joshua. So if you've got it, you can even open it and look at it yourself. Four times in the opening chapter, before he even gets going in this book, he says, be strong and courageous, be strong and very courageous, be strong and courageous, only be strong and courageous. Over and over and over again, they reiterate what it's going to take As they walk into this new land, you need to be strong and courageous because it's going to be volatile. So be strong and courageous in the face of adversity and challenges. I love it. He says, fear the Lord, but in your attempts to keep my commandments in this new land, do not walk in fear. Don't be fearful. Do not be dismayed because I am going to be with you as we do this. Uh, I don't know how long ago it was that we were teaching a class on Wednesday nights about raising resilient children, and this conversation comes right up in the middle of this. It is impossible, literally impossible, for you and I to protect our children from everything that this world has to offer. We can't do it. We cannot protect our kids or those that we love from all the difficulties and hardships, trials and setbacks are universal for every human being. By the way, we, we learn through suffering. That's a pretty biblical message too. The suffering servant Jesus shows us that as he lives. But we shouldn't try to protect our kids from everything. But we literally can't protect our kids from everything. But as we cultivate strength and courage, you and I can foster and cultivate resilience in a generation and it's this process of adapting well and in healthy ways in the face of adversity or trauma or maybe even significant sources of stress. We teach them how to face adversity in a Christ-like way with strength and courage. And so with conviction, we foster virtue, we foster hope. We teach them not to be timid. And we see obstacles and challenges as opportunities and possibilities to grow in strength and courage. And it just builds and builds and builds. But I think we have to be intentional about it. And if I'm completely honest with you, I failed as a dad during COVID. Miserably failed as a dad. I think more than not, my children probably saw me curl up in a ball on the couch, often wrestling with my own anxiety 
with this thing. Instead of being reassuring to my children, even though I didn't know what was going to happen, um, I think that there's times that our kids learn from us even when we're not saying anything. Right now, I re- you rebound from these things and you move on. Jennifer and I, um, she's over here. Hey, babe. Um, I didn't ask you if I could do this. Sorry. Um, ooh, we have a list of what we call parent fails. Anybody else? I'm not going to talk about them either, by the way. Nobody else? Is this just us? It's just me and you. It's just me and you, babe. Nobody else in here has parent fails. Not even Blake. Not, not even y'all. Okay, this is great. Um, no, sorry. You have? We just don't list them. So we list them. And we, as we move through them, we laugh about them a little bit. But Luke's over there going, yeah, I remember some of those. I remember last year, Dad. I remember one of those quite, quite dearly. Um, anyways, sorry. We, 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 we bring this stuff about. And we foster strength and courage even when we don't know what things look like. But I want you to consider the implications of what it looks like for us as adults to live and cultivate strength and courage in the lives of those behind us. And think about the impact that can have on us as we view obstacles and challenges as opportunities. So church, I'm simply asking you this. What would it look like for you to cultivate in your individual lives and the church? Strength and courage. It's the second one. I think the spirit-led people of God cultivate a legacy of wisdom and steadfast observance. This is glaring in the book of Joshua. Joshua, like others before him, wholeheartedly, the text said, followed God in his ways. They stayed the course, right? Um, They held fast. Even when things were hard, they held fast. Um, they, They fixed their eyes, if you would, on God. And then while renewing the covenant with the people of God, Joshua reminds them who they are and what God's been doing. So listen to this. This is Joshua chapter 24, 14 through 15. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your ancestors serve beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He says, make up your mind. <laughs> make up your mind. We're about to head into a pretty volatile place, but it has been given to us. But make up your mind. Choose and decide who it is that you are going to serve. Decide whose wisdom you are going to follow. You're either, you and I, we're either going to follow the wisdom of the world or we're going to follow the wisdom of God. And it says, choose. Choose whose wisdom you will follow. And I think about, well, what is that wisdom? It's peppered all throughout the text. Uh, Grant's already read it this morning, but I think about Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. He says, hear, O Israel. This is pinnacle for who they are, Right? Love the Lord your God, or sorry, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. It's the core. It's the core of who we are. It's fully integrated living when it comes to who God is. Micah will summarize it really easily, but yet also challenging, right? In Micah 6, 8, he says this, he's shown you. O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? Jesus will say it like this in Matthew chapter 22 when he's talking about the greatest command. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. And one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Then he says this, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. There are all kinds of things for us to look at with this when it comes down to steadfast observance to what God teaches us and what he wants for us. And he's saying, I think when I hear these texts, he's saying, here's what I would love for you not to do. Don't compartmentalize your faith. Don't 
bring it to you, bring it with you when you arrive on a Sunday or a Wednesday, but make sure that it is integrated into everything you do and everything you say outside of these spaces. Integrate these commandments into every aspect of your lived experience. Meditate on God's desires, uh, God's values for humanity. Um, Attempt to live faithful and steadfast. You know you're not going to do it perfectly. You can't. None of us can because we still have fleshly bodies this side of eternity. But then it's just also this idea of cultivating wisdom. And it's not just about mastering information. Wisdom is this idea of absorbing God's ways and his will. And then it helps us foster an understanding about how to guide our actions. So may we be a church that cultivates wisdom and steadfast observance to God's words. Three, spirit-led people of God cultivate dependency on the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we get dependence, right? I, I can get to know you long enough that I begin to trust you, and at some point I trust you enough that I know that I can rely on you. I need you in my life. I need you to help me do things. I know that I can depend on you. And it's this action or this support I'm saying to you, I can't do this without you. I need you. But I also know that we've got to be cautious when it comes to dependence because you and I can become dependent on many things that are not healthy for us. So what's it look like then for us as spirit-led people to be dependent on the triune God? It looks like this. We are confident in God's actions. We're entirely focused on Jesus. And we're partnering with and led by the Holy Spirit. And this is developed over a lifetime. It's a process for a church. It's a process for individuals. And so may we cultivate this church. Will our children and generations behind us experience these things as we live out our lived experience? So it's just a big question. Where, who, or what is our dependence focused even today? What are you dependent upon? Who are you dependent upon? How often before your feet hit the ground, before you wake up in the morning, are you already talking to God about being dependent upon him? And then ultimately, I don't think any of this works, by the way, unless we do it together. It's part of why we've been doing what we've been trying to do on Wednesday nights. We knew it was risky. We knew we didn't know how people were going to react or respond. We tried to simply get everybody together in one room, fully integrated, intergenerationally, to look at some practices and worship and teachings, and it's got to start small, but what does it look like for us to pursue God's will together? What's it look like? And it can look different in here, it can look different out there, but I think it's something that we have to do together. And so I think about Joshua, and I think about his days, and I think about the text that says, as long as Joshua was alive and the people that he influenced, Israel followed God. Because he was attentive to God's ways. And so here's my last question for us. Where are we now and how are we doing? How are we doing with cultivating all these things? I want to read to you. If you want to turn to it, you can. It's not going to be on the screen as far as the text goes. If I can read it, I forgot my readers. This is bad. Wow. Joshua 2, 7 through 15. When Joshua dismissed the people... The Israelites all went to their own inheritances to take possession of the land. The people worshipped the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works that the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of God, servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. I'm going to skip down to verse 11. Leslie read this last week. Then the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, And worshipped the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord. The God of their ancestors. Who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They followed other gods. From among the gods of the peoples. Who were all around them. And bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord. And worshipped other gods. So where are we? And how are we doing? (laughs) I was fortunate enough to to work in student ministry for 18 years as a youth minister before transitioning into other roles. I still get the opportunity to work with young adults. I love young people, and I love young adults. And I got to be honest, 
I don't, I don't know that it's entirely fair. Uh, it's not. To generalize the generation like them and say they're just walking away from God. I don't think they're walking away from God because the conversations that I have with them are a little bit different than that. They are craving God. They are craving experiences with God. They are craving to encounter God. There's just one difficult thing that has been getting in the way of that is, and they've been hurt a lot. It's not to put guilt on us or anybody else, but one of the biggest detriments to the young people's faith journey is this. They hear us say one thing, and they watch us do something completely different when it comes to our faith journeys. They hear us come in here and talk about things. They hear us in classes. They hear us say things to us, but then they watch us live a completely different lifestyle. And if that's not confusing enough, I don't know what else is. And so if you wonder why young people are struggling, it's because they look at this and go, is this even authentic? Again, not to be put guilt on us. I'm saying it's for all of us to think about as we move forward, authenticity and genuineness in our own walk. Guess what? When you mess up as a parent or when you mess up as a human, we own it and we work through it and we tell our kids that we've messed up. They are craving God and they're hungry for God. So I don't think we're in a generation that's just turned their backs completely on God. I think they're turning their backs on something a little bit different. And I think you and I have an opportunity to cultivate something very different and raise up an entire generation of Joshua's. So Hendersonville Church, we really do need to be intentional about what it is that we cultivate with our young people and with our people all around us, even in this community. And so even if it means writing it down and saying, this is what we're convicted to, this is who we are going to be, we are going to make up our minds to actually be spirit-led people of God, and we're going to cultivate strength and courage. We're going to cultivate wisdom. We're going to... Practice steadfast observance, even though we don't know how to always do it right. And you know what? We're going to be dependent on the creator of the universe who said he's going to be with us to walk with us. Do me a favor. Go ahead and stand where you are. I ended the very first intro sermon with this very differently. And I want to ask my friend Harrison to come on up here. Harrison, Mr. Harrison Slaughter. Harrison, what's your middle name? Oh, oh, of course. Harrison Owen Slaughter. Yes, my bad. Sorry, Owen. This is my friend. Um, this is my friend uh, Harrison. We're gonna come down here, Harrison. I think they can still see us down here. Is that okay? That's for you. After the first opening uh, message of this, all the kids came up here on stage, and I had some things for you to say to our children. I just want you to hear the voice of somebody young saying something to you. And if you don't mind, just repeat after my friend Harrison here the things that he's going to say, right? It's real simple, call and response, go as slow as you want to, and uh, if they don't respond back, we'll uh, we'll do it again. How's that? So you're going to repeat what he says. We all are. God wants who we are. God wants who we are. God wants what we have. God wants what we have. And God wants what we have to do. God wants what we have to do. Do it one more time. God wants who we are. God wants what we have. And God wants what we have to do. Hendersonville Church, if you haven't thought about it lately, you are beloved children of God. We mess up all the time. But there's a long and loving gaze upon us that wants us to thrive and flourish. He wants, he wants us. He wants who we are. He's created us to be that. He wants the gifts that we have, and he wants us to use those for good in this world. You may be here this morning already pre-thinking about getting baptized, and we can still do that. But I'm just simply going to ask as we sing, Blake, come on up. And as we sing this song, just think about what it looks like to cultivate these things in this church and cultivate a spirit of being spirit-led people of God.